When asked to introduce my friend and colleague, Sonia Clark, I immediately thought fondly of stories I've heard of another American Craft Council conference. In 1957, a young Ken Shore skipped his graduation ceremony at University of Oregon and deferred the start date of a job waiting for him in Portland, Oregon at Oregon Ceramic Studio, later Museum of Contemporary Craft, to head to the first ACC conference at Asilomar. It was there that Ken met Toshiko Takeezu. It was the start of a lifelong friendship that began in a community dedicated to craft. Fast forward to 2006 and the first ACC conference in decades. Several generations gathered again to discuss the state of the field. It was there that many of my cherished friendships began, and especially my friendship with Sonia Clark. Where Ken and Toshiko com connected annually for many years to conduct ceramics workshops, Sonia and I have spent Thursday afternoons preceding the ACC board meetings at the Walker Art Center. She's the best of museum companions, especially when we got rambunctious and were told to quiet down at Museum of Art and Design in New York. <laughs> I could introduce Sonia Clark through her educational credentials. She holds an undergraduate and more recently honorary doctorate from Amherst College, a BFA at the School of the Art, from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, and an MFA from Cranbrook Academy of Art. But these academic institutions are hardly the beginning of her connection with craft. Sonia Clark reminds us that craft begins at home, where learning to make and listening to stories becomes the catalyst of a life's work. I could introduce Sonia Clark by listing her residencies in Italy, China, the US, and more. It's an impressive list, but it doesn't begin to communicate how Sonia employs these opportunities to create her work. The list tells you where she's been, but it doesn't reveal how she works outward and builds communities around the globe through connections with artists with whom she works, talks, and relaxes in these productive environments. Sonia Clark's work and life remind us of how the world and the individual are inextricably intertwined. I could also list any of the over 300 museums and galleries across the globe in which you may have seen her work, or awards such as the United States Artist Fellowship, the Art Prize, and most recently, the 2016 Anonymous Was a Woman. But I think instead that I want to share with you about what Sonia Clark makes. She reminds us of the strength and the metaphoric power of the everyday. She moves in the commonplace, transforming objects to things or materials for her work, such as black plastic combs, combs which Sonia transforms into woven structures and social commentary on an industry built around having good hair. And then she gifts Abraham Lincoln with better hair, building him a bigger and bigger afro on $5 bills. Sonia reminds us about our bodies, about the body, any body, as a site of embodied knowledge and a site of production. For Sonia Clark, her thinking and her head of hair connect community. Today, she wears the work of Kamala Bhagat. Other works remind us of the commodification of black bodies through slavery and the industries of cotton and sugar that continue to impact us today. Sonia makes a space for craft to bring the world in through her more recent work exploring sugar, such as in the bolt of McCarty tartan made from the hand-woven bagasse cloth, sugarcane fiber that represents the Scottish line of Sonia Clark's Jamaican family and the history of the world through a material practice. Sonia Clark sounds the ancestors when MacArthur awardee Regina Carter plays the United States national anthem, the Star Spangled Banner, and the Black American national anthem, Lift Every Voice and Sing, using a bow strung with one of Sonia's own dreadlocks. The powerful quiver is a reminder of the strength of what Sonia calls the primordial fiber, hair as a vehicle for storytelling and social commentary in itself. She reveals the metaphoric possibilities of the simplest of gestures and elemental materials. Sonia Clark stands in her piece, Unravel, where she unravels the Confederate flag, carefully unweaving the textile, thread by thread, separating out red, white, and blue into piles while talking with friends and colleagues and strangers. 
The power of the metaphor in this action and reversal from a structure to materials ready to be remade into something new speaks against the backdrop of this tumultuous election cycle and the increased visibility of ongoing systemic, systematic assault against female and black bodies in a flawed social system and could not prove any better that craft is relevant and endures. Thanks to Sonia Clark, we can see craft in many places. Please welcome Sonia to the stage. Okay, I'm gonna need a moment because Namita almost made me cry. <laughs> Thank you so much, Namita. Um, I am so honored to be here with you all today. Um, I'm just thrilled to be here at this conference, make some new friends. You see, I keep my friends, so um, to make some new friends with those of you who I've had the pleasure to meet this time around at this American Craft Council conference. Um, I want to uh, begin by saying all those accolades that uh, Namita shared about me, that not a single thing on my resume exists without the presence of the people and the communities that I belong to, um, but specifically this wonderful, wonderful, um, what's going on here? Ah, that way, haha, the green button. It's pretty obvious, but. Um, <laughs> Um, the wonderful, wonderful faculty and staff and students and alumni who are at Virginia Commonwealth University where I've had the pleasure of teaching and um, chairing that department for almost 11 years. So if we can just take a moment, um, can I ask those of you who are my colleagues to stand? Stand, okay, I'm also taking attendance. So, right, okay, and if you're an alum of VCU, will you stand? All right, and if you're a student at VCU, will you stand? So keep standing, keep standing, keep standing. Student at VCU, will you stand? All right, there are a couple of you. You have to get to know these people. I'm just pointing them out so you know who they are. I have a great, great group of people that are in my community. I want to share them with you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I can't do what I do without some folks who are not here, um, specifically Meg Roberts, who is an alum of our program and my studio manager, my beloved husband, Daryl Harper, and my right hand, and I often refer to her as my right lobe, Debbie Quick. <clears throat> yes, right. oh, people who know those people know, yeah, they should be applauded. Um, when we use the most familiar materials as craft people, we have the opportunity to connect with many people who engage those materials. So today I want to talk with you about the engagement through materials and you thinking about those materials as language. I want to trace connections between hair and textiles and language. I want to invoke ancestral ties, evoke historical legacies, and I want to do this through the extended lens of what we've all come to share, celebrate, learn about, and critique the field of craft. I want to think about hair as textile, textile as language, hair as language. But this is the thing, as I indicated to you just now, I, I don't want to go this alone. If you go alone, you can go fast. If you go together, we can go far. So I'm also thinking about creative participation, expertise and authorship, framing communities. The ideas that I'm going to be sharing with you are so persistent in my practice that I can't show you the work in a linear fashion. All the ideas seem to double back in this sort of, sort of funny way, like when the mountains kind of breathe themselves into the clouds and then the clouds rain back into the mountains, only to start the cycle again. But I might be getting ahead of myself here. Let me tell you a story of a remarkable woman. This woman is named Chummy. I'm good. Thanks. See, I have a team of people. Am I seeming parched? Do I need some water? OK, yeah. I'll take the hint. All right. Um, 
So this remarkable woman um, is Chummy. Chummy was my grandmother. Um, we were, she's now an ancestor. We were on this planet for only a decade together. She was an itinerant grandmother. None of us called her grandma. We all called her Chummy because she was everyone's chum. Um, this image sort of says it all. There is Chummy as a, working as a tailor. Um, and she would always say that she was a tailor. She could sew a fine men's suit. And she is sp sporting the best hairstyle, an afro. I'm just saying, it's the best hairstyle. And also the best hair color, it is white. The Yoruba people will talk about white as a color that talks about our ancestry, talks about wisdom, talks about peacefulness, because our el elders, those who are about to become ancestors, their hair turns white. I long for that afro, and these gray hairs are slow in coming, so clearly I have a lot of wisdom that I have not yet earned. Hair and textiles and language. One of the things that Chummy did when I was a child is that she would say to me, come stitch with me and I'll tell you stories. While she was sporting this great, gravity-defying, glorious white afro. And I knew who I wanted to be when I grew up. My first teacher, Chummy. But I'd also like to thank ACC for giving awards to two of my later teachers, Nick Cave, who has been a wonderful mentor and like an older brother, and Gerhard Nodell. So just another applause for those two. <laughs> Hairdressing is, as Namita noted, it's tricky when you're friends introduce you. She sort of did half my artist talk for me, so that's great. Um, hairdressing is, for me, the first textile art form. I have known this since I was a child. When my grandmother was teaching me how to sew in our house in Washington, D.C., right across the street from us was the ambassador's residence for the nation of Benin. Benin, a small West African country at the time called Dahomey, um, the Ajibade family, Ambassador Ajibade and his family of 14 would just welcome us into their homes. Now, I'm almost 50, so this was in the 70s, and my parents were decked out in the 70s. My mom had her afro, my dad had pants that you could, I mean, they, you know, you could hear them swing those bell bottoms, right? <laughs> And when you have two children and your neighbors have 12, you just drop your two children off at the neighbor's house and nobody notices. <laughs> and what would happen is that we would get these glorious, glorious hairstyles. So from a young child, as a young child, I connected textiles and, hair uh, textiles and stories, grand, glorious white afros, and hair as a sculptural art form. This image that you see on the left um, reminds me of this thought that this uh, notion that Roland Barthes came up with of the way that we read Im images, either, either through studium or punctum. Like we know that this is an image of someone getting their hair done or someone doing someone's hair. That's what the studium reading is. But the punctum is, when I first saw this image, I remembered having my hair done. I remembered being in between the legs of some cool teenager who might have been anywhere from the ages of 13 to 18 who was doing my hair in some sculptural hairstyle. And I knew that that hairstyle that I would be walking with for the next two weeks was art and sculpture on my head. These were very early seeds that were planted, and they are still with us here today. I have not forgiven my mother for this being the only photograph of the glorious hairstyles that I donned in the 70s. And so in early works, I decided that I was going to try and remember those hairstyles, trying to remember those fleeting works of art that lived on my head. One of the things that I would like to share with you is that as we think of cultures that use hairstyling in very grand and complicated ways. That the notion of hairstyling is not one of vanity, but it's actually one of ritual. So I'll get to that in a moment. 
while I was in DC, getting these amazing hairstyles, having the itinerant grandmother who would go from Ghana to Jamaica to the UK um, to, and to the US to visit all of her grandchildren and telling me about stories and connecting textiles and hair and stories and stitching. There was this wonderful artist by the name of J.D. Ojikeri, who is also now an ancestor. And J.D. Ojikeri was photographing African-American women, I mean, sorry, African women on the west coast of Africa who were donning these amazing hairstyles as well. And when I ran across this book, I realized that some of these hairstyles were the hairstyles that I too had as, has as a child. So J.D. Ojikeri is one of the people who, um, kept this sentiment in play that hairstyling is, in fact, not just an art form, but a ritual act. So here's an example of a piece that I made that's actually a headdress, not a hairstyle, inspired by court messengers. So what you see on the top left is Eshu. Eshu, Eshu Elegba, is a, a deity from Yoruba culture, from Nigeria, Benin, um, that region, the Yoruba people. And Eshu goes between the heaven world and the ancestors and is a messenger. And Eshu is known for having this phallic long hair that connects him to the ancestors. Living court messengers have a similar hairstyle. You see just that little point on the top of their head. Everything shaved but the little antenna that too connects them to their ancestors. And then my piece, hook head, that you see there on the right. But let's turn to cloth for a moment. Cloth's ability to speak. I don't need to tell this crowd that um, text and textile are related, right? You guys get that. From the Latin texere, meaning to weave. When I was um, getting out of school in the late 80s, the first degree from Amherst College, and going into school at um, the Art Institute of Chicago, kente cloth was everywhere. It was used as a symbol to, um, a marketing symbol, actually, to say to African Americans, we would like your money, please. We've made this product for you, and we put kente cloth on it. So knowing that it was being used in the American context as a as a device to get the money out of everybody's pocket, um, I thought, well, what is this cloth actually being, what is this cloth actually saying? And so I did uh, some research at the Smithsonian, the National Museum of African Art, um, where I had an internship at the time, and I learned about how this cloth really does speak. The cloth that's in the center is, um, is so filled with proverbs that are woven into the patterns of the cloth that it is actually referred to as an adwanaasa, which means my skill is exhausted. The weaver's skill is exhausted. And the cloth speaks and speaks and speaks and speaks, and like language and like proverb, the way that it speaks can change within its context. So I wanted to dig deeper, and so I went to West Africa, as I am wont to do, I will just get in a plane. You don't even have to ask me twice. The bag is packed. I'll get in a plane. So I went to West Africa to discover more about this cloth. And then when I had the privilege of studying with, um, with the great Gerhard Nodell, I made this cloth, which was to bring together both African -Amer Africanness and Americanness. So in my lifetime, people of African descent have been called these are the nice names, by the way. That, you guys can laugh at that. That's OK. All right. I give you permission, because we're not going to say any of the non-nice names. But everything from Negro, which is what my grandmother would say, to um, black, to Afro-American, to African-American, but still qualifying the stance and the identity. So I wanted to make a piece that was attempting to have this balance between Africanness and Americanness. And it's also a little bit of a um, critique about American means white. So you have to qualify it with African so that you know that you're talking about someone of African descent. So I went to 50 women in Detroit and I gave them this cloth that took symbols from the kente cloth that I had learned 
and of course wove it together with the American flag. And I asked these 50 women to tie their head with a gele, you know, to tie their head in a head, head wrap, um, and to tell me what they knew about kente cloth and tell me what they knew about the American flag. And so in that way, the cloth became a way that we talked about our identity in the context of being Americans, African Americans, and women. Just to give you a sense of how these cloths can be read, the stripe that you see, that pattern that you see that is green and red and black, um, that's a symbol that's called um, in the Twi language, um, Babadua, and it refers to healing and resilience. And these were the kind of symbols that I was weaving into this cloth. So for a long time, even before I did that project with the 50 women, I've been thinking about how artwork forms and engages and defines community. And in this way, I'm thinking about Pablo Helguera's book that I'm sure most of you are familiar with, The Framing of Creative Participation and Collaborative Participation. So again, when I decided to pursue art, I picked cloth as a medium because cloth is like DNA. DNA is also like a language written across a span of life. And because cloth is something that people have been using for a long time, it absorbs us. It knows something of our humanity. It structures who we are. And we've been communicating and designing through cloth and, th th through, cloth and through crafted mediums with our ancestors for so long that the dialogue is just like that. It is just like DNA. Artist Sam Gilliam, who happens to be the father of my best friend, said to me, others look to a monument, we look to a piece of cloth. And here I take that idea of monumentality to mean enduring memorable examples of something. So if cloth is like our DNA, let me begin with something of my own heritage. What you're seeing on the left-hand side of this slide is a Nagungun from the Yoruba people of Nigeria. Now, it's hard for me, like many African Americans, to trace my African heritage, but my father was from Trinidad, my mother from Jamaica. And most Trinidadians, most Africans who were brought to Trinidad came from the part of West Africa where the Yoruba are most present. The Yagungun is a celebration, a living quilt of one's ancestors, those named and those unnamed. When the Yagungun is danced, those little strips of cloth that you see wisp by the ears of those who are gathered, and it is said that the ancestors are whispering to you. Well, that's a field and a medium I want to be involved in. That's a beautiful metaphor. I hope to aspire to have that kind of metaphor power, metaphorical impact in my work one day. Clearly, some Yoruba made it to Jamaica, because what you see on the right-hand side of the slide is Pitchy Patchy, the poor man's version, that is to say, the enslaved man's version of, um, of the Yagungun. Imagine if you were treated as chattel put in a boat as a commodity, did not manage to die, but made it across the middle passage. The first thing that you would want to do was celebrate the strength and the resilience of your ancestors. And that's what happened in Jamaica with Pitchy Patchy. So I got to know Pitchy Patchy first and the Agungun later. I also like to th think of the DNA of objects. And this idea of object-driven inquiry that Ned Cook was talking about yesterday. The idea of the inside story versus the outside story. And in this case, the idea of the power of secrecy. So let's think about the history of the word as its own DNA. The history of a word, in particular, the word bead, which comes from bidan, meaning to ask or pray, because this is how we use those objects, to use the beaded prayers, to use the rosary as beads to count where we were in that prayer cycle, and that those two, the action and the physical object, got fixed as one. So I started the Beaded Prayers Project based on Ghanaian warrior um, shirts, these heirlooms that you see in the top left-hand side. This idea of the collective made amulets that are filled with powerful medicinal stuffs and prayers. Those objects are said to protect the warriors from their battles, to spiritual protection as well as a physical protection. And so I took that strategy and asked people from around the world to write down their own hopes, 
wishes, dreams, or prayers, not to share them, but to seal them shut in packets. I ask people to make two, one for themselves in celebration of their individuality, and the other to belong to the collective. This project is almost 20 years old now. 5,000 people have participated in it from 35 different nations. But let's go back to Jamaica. Let's go back to me for a second. First of all, let me just ask, are there any Jamaicans in the audience? Anybody? Okay, that is actually the first time that has ever happened, so we're gonna have to work on our diversity. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> So back to Jamaica, the national motto, I was gonna make that Jamaican in the audience pass a, a, a little pop quiz. Um, the national motto for Jamaica is out of many one people, which is based on that population's multiracial roots. So again, my, my Jamaican mother, um, her maiden name is McCarty. It's, it's a family name, it's not a slave name. My great-grandfather was from Scotland. My great-grandmother, harder to tell where she was from, but she is said that to be, an in, uh, at some point, an indentured servant who was um, from North Africa. So on my mom's side of the family, every kind of person is represented, and I wanted to make as, um, as Namita pointed out in her introduction, I wanted to make a cloth that not only spoke about the McCarty tartan, um, our family cloth and lineage on the, S the Scottish side, but to talk about how the McCartys came to look like me. And so I made a cloth from sugarcane, the bagasse fiber, the reclaimed, once you squeeze out all the sugar, once you've taken the stuff that you want, what is left, the fibers that have remained. Now here's the thing, this cloth is about 15 feet long, um, and I thought I was gonna go around to my diasporic family and take these very formal portraits of each one of them and make art. But what actually happened is that one of my aunts um, earlier last year became an ancestor and with a little bit of fear and trepidation, I took my very small bag and I put this 15 yards of cloth in that bag and I said, okay, a lot of family is gonna be gathered. This will be a good opportunity to wrap my family in the McCarty Tartan and take these formal portraits. Best laid plans, didn't happen. I took the cloth out of the bag my family immediately recognized it as a McCarty tartan, but they also realized that its materiality wasn't quite right. It wasn't made from proper Scottish wool. And when I had them guess what it was made out of, they didn't say, they guessed hemp first, um, and then they went to, um, to bagasse, which is a material that they're familiar with. And then there was nothing formal about these portraits. <laughs> I don't have a formal portrait yet. The, uh, what I had done is unwittingly made a family heirloom, a family-owned cloth, a for us, by us, a little fubu. My family totally understood that this cloth was representing who we are and the complexity of our histories. They understood that it had to do with the complexity of human trafficking, people as commodities, a global con economy in which almost everyone was involved. And yet we refer to this so simply as a triangle trade. It makes me think about James Baldwin's sweet but precious poem, Imagination Creates the Situation, and the Situation Creates the Imagination, it may, of course, be the other way around. Columbus was discovered by what he found. The visceral pull of hair, the pull of heritage, this West African concept of knowing one's roots has to do with your ability to be able to name yourself 10 generations back. That's how they put it. Name yourself 10 generations back. Each one of us are the sums of all those people who have come before us. And so when I made this piece rooted and uprooted, I realized I actually have no trouble finding my way to the highlands of Scotland. I am 
12 generations back in Europe, and only six on the African side. I love my friends who are writers. I often tease them because they, they have a way with words and can say things succinctly, and this is not a skill that I have. So to quote Isabella Allende, the image of those trees from my home of my ancestors often comes to mind when I think of my destiny. It is my fate to wander from place to place and adapt to new soils. I believe I will be able to do that because of the handfuls of Chilean soil caught in my roots. I carry them with me always. So this idea of using textiles, using thread as a as a, a, a placeholder for hairdressing techniques and the presence of African Americans and the African presence is something I sort of was forced to do in 2010 because I got angry, I got pissed off. I live in Richmond, Virginia. It is the seat of the Confederacy. And in 2010, former got, Former Virginia um, Governor Bob McDonald um, proclaimed April Confederate History Month. Now, let me tell you, I didn't have a problem with that in and of itself. Uh, what I didn't like is that he had, in that proclamation, he made no mention of the free labor that African Americans provided when we were considered chattel in this country that provided the wealth that this nation enjoys. And for that reason, I decided that I needed to insert the story in the half-told story. And so I made the American flag with cornrows, which talks about the land that we worked, and the stars of the American flag in Bantu knots of the Bantu people. So to speak of the people and to work, talk about the free labor and the wealth that has built our nation. But I didn't stop there. A few years later, it was the um, it was the um, celebration, the sesquicentennial celebration of the end of the Civil War, and I wondered what that would look like if we measured through cloth really the end of the Civil War. So I made two pieces. I made Unraveled, which you see on the left. I took a Confederate flag down to its threads and just reduced it to red, white, and blue. But that wasn't enough. I had to actually see what did it feel like to have this action of how far have we actually come. And so, if you want to go farther, you engage people. So I asked people on June 11th of 2015 at a, um, at an opening in Chelsea at Mixed Green's gallery to join me in unraveling the cloth thread by thread. Some people were, some of my dear friends, like this is Lowry Sims that you see on the top of the slide. And then opening was done. I had some business in Italy. I flew, got on a plane, flew to Italy, and six days later, while I was in Italy, the Charleston massacre occurred, and suddenly we were talking about the Confederate flag again and its removal and the power of that cloth. So I want to share with you a piece that another artist sent to me, not knowing it was a piece, not knowing it was going to be a collaboration. This was an artist who said, I've seen your work with a Confederate flag. I'm a European-American artist. I'm from the South, and we have these heirloom Confederate flags in my family, and I just don't want them. Can I send you one from the 1930s? It's a beautiful linen one, and he said it's beautiful because it's old, not because it's a Confederate flag. You know, he wanted to make sure I understood his politics. And he sent it to me in the hopes that I might unravel it or do something with it. And when he sent it to me, I realized the piece was done because it lives sort of as this truce between our two racial designations as a European-American and an African-American. 
And in one sense, it's a little like those beaded prayers that I shared with you earlier. It's kind of a prayer between two artists that we will come further than we've already come. When I was at the Smithsonian um, doing research, I discovered the cloth that we actually should be celebrating. This is the Confederate flag of truce. In fact, it's half of the Confederate flag of truce. It's one of my favorite pieces of cloth. It's the cloth that ended the Civil War. It was simply a dish rag, a linen dish rag that was woven in Richmond and found its way to Appomattox. And it is what ended the Civil War. It was a white piece of cloth that, they, that um, Lee picked up and said, OK, let's just end this. Enough already. And that cloth got divided in half. Half lives in the Smithsonian. And the other half has been taken into little bits and pieces and is all over the South, apparently. And so what I've decided is to remake that cloth, a cloth that was taken apart that needs to come whole again. As De David Hammonds, the artist, brilliant artist David Hammonds said, sometimes I realize that my art is both commentary and oath-taking. And this piece is falling into that category. So hair also brings us together and pulls us apart, right? The kind of hair that we grow separates us into racial designation, separates us into categorizations of who is beautiful and who is not. I'm always reminded of the fact that there will be a picture, there's this picture of Beyonce, Queen Bey, um, standing next to her good friend, um, Gwyneth Paltrow, and they both have blonde straight hair, and only one of them grew it. <laughs> So cloth is DNA to actual DNA. And this idea of using hair as a medium is certainly not new, as you can see in the, these Victorian hair wreaths that I'm sharing with you. So a few pieces that I've made using hair, my own hair itself. Hair is a receptacle for our DNA. It's what holds us together, but it's also what separates us. Our DNA is really not that different. The person who looks most different from me on the outside in this audience might actually be genetically closest to me. And our hair is a receptacle that holds that closeness, but also the kink and the curl versus the straight is one of the things that separates us. It's a powerful, powerful, powerful medium. OK. I would like everyone who was of African descent to stand up. You all will figure this one out. <laughs> and there's my point. Thank you. So I'm interested in textiles that are about textiles. You know, I have to show you, a, I think probably Gerhard is the first person who um, hit me to this beautiful, beautiful 16th century tapestry that lives in the Victoria and Albert Museum. Um, I love this, it's so postmodern. So it's the three fates, Cloto who spins the thread of life, Lachesis who allots the length of the yarn, and Atropos who does the final snip. All of that, a metaphor about life, about a thread made on a textile. I wish I was the tapestry artist or one of them who worked on this. So I started thinking about measuring things. And though this piece is not an actual thread, and it's not made out of hair, it is hair thin. It's the most expensive piece I've ever made material-wise. It's 18 karat gold that measures in inches to miles the length from Cape Coast, Ghana, to Richmond, Virginia, some 5,000 some inches. The ebony wood is from Africa. I'll tell you something that's a little funny. I grew up in Washington, DC. I grew up in a middle class neighborhood in Washington, DC. That middle class neighborhood was referred to as the Gold Coast because black people lived there and we were middle class. Not wealthy, but middle class. Um, so I have some very specific ties to this piece. And for those of you who are interested in hearing a little bit more about this, I'd encourage you to look at the art, to um, do a little Google search for the art assignment on PBS, because um, I talk about this piece. 
But I was also thinking about something that Lydia said, I think it was Lydia, about fabrication being revealed. This piece took seven people to make it. Seven people. I had Jeremy Zietz, who was a recent graduate. Um, was a, he was a person who actually uh, made the, the wooden spool for me. I had um, Danielle do the ordering for me. I had Susie Gonch do some, this is how thin you should have the wire if you want it to be hair thin. I had Heath Matesic Snyder say, actually, you should get Jeremy to do that for you. I had Meg Roberts <laughs> and um, Grace Kobelius, my studio assistants, actually help me spin the wire onto this spool. It takes a village. Another kind of measurement, though not in length, but in number of hairs, is this piece called skein. Um, I don't know the woman whose hair this is. I don't know her. Um, but I did ask to gather the, from one of the hairdressers that I worked with, I asked them if they knew anyone who was cutting their hair um, from dreadlocks, if they could uh, share those dreadlocks with me. So the thing is, that the number of hairs on my head number about 80,000. And if, you're, if you have blonde or straight hair or thinner hair, it would be less than that. But on average, the number of hairs on my head are about 80,000. I think I said 8,000, 80,000. That is also the number of people that were forcibly migrated from Africa to the United States of America and to the Caribbean at the height of slavery. The number of hairs on my head a way of measuring. Another way of measuring is this abacus, which I've turned into a clock of sorts. Using my own hair as a stand-in or a synecdoche for all African Americans. In the making of these objects with these soft felted balls, I wanted to remain, have that clicking sound that remains. You know, that's how someone who's using an abacus actually knows what they're doing. It's not only the touch, but it's the sound. So they have metal on either side. And what is being measured here is that the slide that you see, the image that you see on the left reads um, 1863, and the image that you see on the right um, should read 2016, but it actually reads 2015. And so that piece actually appears in a, um, a video called um, Counting Change. Channeling Jasper Johns. So Namita and I happened to be at the Walker, looking at this wonderful piece by Jasper Johns that I'm sure you all know, that after image of the, um, it's Jasper Johns, so there's a flag involved, right? And so you see Jasper Johns' work, and it's black and green and orange. And David Hammonds, of course, has done a little spoof on that, because black and green and red, of course, is um, power to the people. Um, do you stare at this image, and then you get the after image of the American flag? So I made this piece called Constellation, using the hairs of my body to use and make these little hairballs that become like a constellation. You probably can't see it so well from the back. But when you see this piece up close, you stare at it, you close your eyes, and then the African presence, and that's all of us now, right? You all stood up. The African presence, our DNA that happens to be contained in my hair and your hair as well, becomes that starry night. So I love when Lydia Matthews was talking about the shining stars that are supported by all that dark matter. So this is the thing. I, am, I mentioned my husband, Daryl Harper. He's the cutest guy I've ever met. We've been married for 20 years. I still have a crush on him. I hope to have a crush on him for the next 40. That would be convenient. Um, he is a musician, and I'm biased, but he's a very talented musician. And it took me a very long time, considering that I'm married to a musician, to think about putting hair and music together. It was actually Maya Angelou, this quote by Maya Angelou that made me think about it. My hair, a hive of honeybees, is a queenly glory, crackles like castanets, hums like marimbas. So Maya helped me get there. But Regina Carter actually made it happen. 
So as, um, as Namita shared with you, I, I re-haired a violin bow with a dreadlock, and then I asked Regina Carter to play this. Anybody know what that is? Lift every voice and sing, also known as the Negro National Anthem. Um, I like to think, think that that's what our ancestors sound like. Have you heard them before? It's a little like that whisper of the, of the Yagungun. Not nearly as good, but my, um, my artistic attempt. Language and hair. So are the keys muted in this piece? or do they speak a new language? Remington made guns before they made typewriters. The power of the pen and the power of the sword. I made this piece, it came very quickly in the studio, because I always have hairballs around. Um, so it came very quickly, and this model typewriter um, is from the 1930s, and I like to think that this is the kind of typewriter that Richard might, Wright might have used to write Native Son. I was thinking about Thurman Statham saying, every me medium has its own hidden language. And that actually is something that led me to this. I'm hoping you guys can see that a little bit in the back. If you're impressed by this piece, be impressed by the um, Bo Peng, who is a graphic designer who was an alum of VCU, who agreed to collaborate with me to make up a language that was made out of, the, or a font that was made out of the curl of my own hair. I asked Rita Dove, who was a poet laureate of the Commonwealth of Virginia, a Pulitzer Prize winner, a National Humanities, she's won a National Humanities Medal from President Clinton, and Obama presented her with a National Medal of the Arts, so she's kind of badass, right? I asked Rita Dove to name this font for me, and she named it Twist. So I want to talk a little bit about combs for a while because I think in the same way that any tool, any word, any piece of cloth, any medium has this deep, deep history, these things, fine tooth combs, which are intended for straight-haired people, have a deep history as well. Remember that proverb that I told you or that sentiment that you don't know who you are unless you can name yourself 10 generations back? I wanted to see what that looked like. So that first comb that's touching the baseboard, let's say that's me or that's you. And then the next two combs, the iteration, the first iteration, are your parents, and the next two, your grandparents, and your great-grands, and your great-grands, et cetera, et cetera. It ends up being 10,000, I mean 1,025 people all together. That's a lot of people that got busy to make you. So you actually can never feel lonely. I don't want to hear it. You're never lonely. You're always walking with a posse. And also, we're probably related. You know, some, one of my combs got mixed up with one of your combs. So we should be treating each other like family. Actually, maybe better than family. So using combs, I also started to think about um, the idea of this Hegelian sort of proposition. And I have a lot of problems, problems with Hegel, but just bear with me on this one. Hegel had this notion that if you start with a thesis, you're going to end up with an antithesis and eventually lead to a synthesis. So if curly hair is the thesis, then the antithesis might be the fine tooth comb, and the synthesis is the fine tooth combs as curly hair. I also started thinking about how DNA is a kind of portraiture, in the same way as listening to Regina Carter, um, genius violinist, play our ancestors. What kind of portraiture could I make out of these combs? I'm a simple person, so I went to someone historical. I went to Madam C.J. Walker. I wonder if some of you might have seen this piece when it was at the Museum of Arts and Design, when um, it reopened at uh, Columbus Circle. 
Madam C.J. Walker was born 100 years before I was. She's purported to be one of the first self-made women millionaires. You will hear one of the first self-made black women millionaires, but she's actually one of the first self-made women millionaires. And she made it, all that money, before she died in 1919 through the business of hair care. I like to think that she was also a textile person of sorts. This is a quote from her. I am a black woman from the cotton fields of the South. I was promoted to the wash tub. I was promoted to the kitchen. I promoted myself to the business of hair on my own ground. It's this text that is read, um, that is written on each one of these combs. Each comb has one of those words. Every time she gets into that rhythm of, I was promoted to, I was promoted to, I promoted myself, the combs take a turn. Hair and textiles are related language. So, if they are, then there should be a fluency between them. So I decided that I should go to the native speakers. Using my body as a canvas, I went to hairdressers in Richmond and I asked them to do my hair. That's not so strange. And then I said, here's this canvas stitched with silk thread. Be a textile artist. And they said, what? And then they did magnificent things. I almost couldn't make artwork for a little while because they did such magnificent things with those textiles. Um, the Haircraft Project is one of those things that completely confirms in me the idea that if you bring to light the talent of people who are often not seen and you do it together, you will go far. This project met with um, This project was quite successful in, uh, in Richmond, Virginia, in terms of bringing together many, many communities. And then it went to Art Prize, and it became very successful at Art Prize. And so many of the women were very happy about that when I wrote them checks. And then the MFA Boston bought it. And I wrote them another check. And some of the women said, oh, we want to be artists. <laughs> And I said, you all already are artists, and here's the thing, your commission work, you get paid immediately. I have, come, let me show you my studio storage space of all the artwork that is just sitting there. Don't give up your day job, you are artists and you get paid. So this is a shout and a nod to Ja, Ingrid, Ife, Marsha, Natasha, Jamika, Anita, Kamala, Jasmine, Shonda, Dion, and Nasira. But I didn't want to leave the gentleman out, so one of the things that I did was I have a friend who runs a poetry festival in Miami, and he invites artists to be part of that poetry festival's mission, which is in April to expose everyone in Miami to a poem. So he's a poet, so it's a really short mission, so that's great. But it's very generative, right? Like all of you were thinking, everyone? What? How do you do that? And so of course, they're the people who come and they sky write their poems, or they write them on the top of buildings that many planes fly over. But he also said it could be small and human scale. And I said, small and human scale is perfect for me. And so what I decided to do is that I'd been working with ladies and hairdressers for so long that I decided to bring together barbershops and literacy. And you know there are a lot of programs that are happening around this. Well, you'll find in a lot of, um, a lot of cities around our nation that little boys or men will get discounts or free haircuts if they read to their barbers. So I don't have a lot of new ideas, but I like good ones, so I take, steal them. So I did the um, haircut for a poem project in Miami. And um, this project was inspired by the fact that black men are getting killed in our nation. And the reason that black men are getting killed in our nation is actually the 13th Amendment. Let me read it to you. 
neither slavery nor solitude, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime, except as a punishment for crime. So you can't enslave someone, and you can't make them involuntarily serve you, unless there's a crime. So as soon as the 13th Amendment was passed, blackness got criminalized. And this is why we see black men getting killed for doing nothing. So I wanted to do something about that. I needed to address it. The Black Lives Matter isn't new. It's ongoing. This is just a new chapter of it. So I asked the, these gentlemen to recite this poem by Calvin Herndon that was written in 1976. Calvin Herndon was a professor at Oberlin College and part of the Black, Lives, um, Black Arts Movement. And the poem is, I am not a metaphor or symbol. This you hear is not a cat being maimed in the street. I am being maimed in the street. It is I who weep, laugh, feel pain, or joy. Speak this, because I exist. These words are my words. My mouth speaks them, my hand writes. It is my fist you hear beating against your ear. Each gentleman who read that poem received a free haircut. They were all on the phone telling their friends that free haircuts were being given, and it was a glorious thing, a glorious day. Last week, this piece of art that you see on my head was done by Kamala Bhagat in the performance that I did called Translations. What I did was I asked, um, I asked Kamala to do my hair as I was reading poems written by black women about hair, written in that hair font I showed you. And I was basically rendered illiterate. I wanted to see how it felt to learn a language again, and so to do that publicly. What this says, this poem, um, this little excerpt by, um, re, uh, by uh, Audre Lorde says, since naturally black is naturally beautiful, I must be proud. And it goes on. The hairstyle that I'm wearing here with you, you might see between it the similarities in the very early slide of that little girl who was very proud of the hairstyle that she had, the art that she walked with on her head. Hair, thread, and lineage, those ancestral fibers worked into magical sculptures at a young age. So in short, this is what happens to a young girl who realizes that she can be art if put in the right hands. Thank you.